So this is going to be available on YouTube, and you simply just Google YouTube DNA and Family Tree Research, and you will find it there. So that saves you on taking notes, but please do take notes if you do want to. Um, we're going to talk touch on a variety of different topics over the course of the next 40 minutes or so, um, and uh, it is going to be a kind of a uh, rapid run through DNA project administration. So if there is anything you don't understand, then please do put up your hand and maybe ask a pertinent question at the time, but we'll also deal with all of those questions that you uh, asked just now at the end of the session. So the other thing to, to uh, note is that on that YouTube channel, DNA and Family Tree Research, I have got two presentations, which I'm concertina-ing into this one presentation. So if you want to see more information about setting up a um, DNA surname project, then look at this uh, video, which is Getting Started with DNA, Starting a Project and Recruiting Testers. So that's going to be particularly relevant for those of you who are thinking about starting a DNA project. And then this one about managing your Y-DNA project and interpreting the results. Uh, that is also available on YouTube. Uh, so those are two additional resources that you can check out. So uh, one of the first questions that you have to ask yourself is why do a surname project? And uh, the uh, usual answer is that you've got um, a whole load of branches ending in a whole load of brick walls and you don't know where to, to turn to next. So the DNA can hopefully unite these different branches under um, a specific genetic family. And that's why we would do a DNA testing. So for example, in my Spiran surname project, we have identified 235 branches of Spirans all over the world. How are they connected to each other? That's where DNA will come in and hopefully uh, give us some, further, some information. Um, and here's an example of the family tree, say for the Spirans, and here is Spiran Adam, or Adam Spiran, let's call him Adam Spiran. And he started off in Africa 200,000 years ago, and then they moved out of Africa and they spread all across the world. Um, but the problem is that we are missing a lot of the data. And uh, hopefully DNA will, will make, make the tree look like that, and we'll be able to uh, amalgamate a lot of these 235 branches into a se several larger groups, and that's what we're hoping to accomplish with the DNA project. Um, here's the Y-DNA, you saw that this morning, and those are the four bases, that's G binding with C, A with T, and the two types of markers, the STOR marker and the single nucleotide polymorphism, the SNP. So we'll be looking at both of those in the presentation today. Um, let's look at, first of all, about interpreting results. And this is it's very important to think about your project as a television set, okay? Um, in actual fact, I'm going to show you the slides that are just previous to that one. Uh, I, because it gives you a very, very nice representation of um, uh, what your project actually looks like. So if I show you my flat screen television set, which I'm very, very proud of, um, it took me days to put this up. You know, and the people come into my living room and they say, wow, what a fantastic flat screen television. I say, yes, it's the top of the range, it's absolutely fantastic. Uh, and they admire it, but they have no idea of, of the trouble that I went to to actually put this in. And this is what your DNA project is, is like. That on the outside, it looks very, very sleek, but you are actually in the background doing a lot of work. And this is the room behind <laughs> the television set. Are so I, it took me days to break through that wall. I only discovered afterwards it was a supporting wall, so I had to put in iron joists and everything. I'm joking. Um, but this is what your project will look like. And um, uh, so it's like a television set, you know, and, and the flat screen is the public view, okay? And that uh, public view is, is, is something that you'll set up yourself, but you are in the background, in the back of the television set, making it look good for the public, and all of these cables that go into the back are the private pages from each of your members. So uh, it is quite a large 
you know, the infrastructure is quite complicated, and it's just too important to visualize uh, just exactly where you are when you're dealing with your project, because sometimes you'll be on the public pages, sometimes you'll be in the admin pages, and sometimes you'll actually have access to the private pages of each individual member and you'll be checking them out. So just think of it in those terms and it makes things a little bit easier. This is the public page of the Spear and Surname project. You can see the kit numbers here, um, each of the individual members here, the most distant known ancestors here, country of origin, the Hapler group, and then all of the markers with all of the values for each of the markers stacked on top of each other. And you can see that the groups, uh, these people are grouped into genetic family one. Here's genetic family three. Down here, there's only two people. You will be grouping these people yourself um, by going into the administration side of your project and uh, grouping them accordingly. Okay? So uh, there is a lot of work behind what eventually appears as your public page. Uh, there are various ways that you can. Uh, access the results. You can look at the classic or the colorized versions. I like to go with the colorized because it has uh, a very nice um, description of uh, the mutations. They appear as color. You don't get that in the classic view. And this is Genetic Family 1 from the Spirin project. There's um, several important aspects. This is the, wide, this is the first 37 markers. Uh, they're normally divided into three panels. The first panel is the first 12 markers, Y-DNA uh, 1 to 12. The second panel is Y-DNA 13 to 25, and then the third panel goes up to 37. So that's just the way that they do the, the testing in, in blocks, in panels. Um, you can, sorry, you can get, um, you can just test for Y-DNA 12 if you want to. So for example, with some people, um, I recommend that they just do a 12 marker test. Now, you're not going to get a huge amount of information out of that, but for example, I work with um, a Jamaican group in Birmingham, in England, and I encourage them to do a YDNA 12 as a starter, because that is going to take them back along their father's 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 line, and just a 12 marker test will tell them whether their father's 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 line goes back to an African man or a European man. So YDNA 12 is very useful for, for actually defining that particular ancestral line. And then, of course, it's up to the individual. Do you want to upgrade to a higher marker, or do you want to switch from that particular ancestral line maybe to another one that you're more interested in? So for, for people with African ancestry or mixed ancestry, it's a very good way of saying, well, your father's 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 line goes back to an African man. Do you actually want to explore that a little bit more? Oh, yes, please. Okay, then upgrade to 37 markers. So YDNA does have some useful applications. And I'll be talking a little bit more about another application later on. Um, the other important thing is these mutations here, which occur as these colored boxes. And um, these are what differentiate uh, the different members of the group from each other. Uh, the, because there's various, f there, there are few mutations here, you can say that the vast majority of these people, well, the, all of these people, are either an exact match are a very close match and therefore are closely related because they all have the same surname or a variant of the same surname. They're probably related to a common ancestor within the last 300, 400, 500 years. The maroon colored markers here are fast mutating markers. A mutation on a fast mutating marker is less relevant than a mutation on a slow mutating markers which are the ones not in maroon. So for example, these mutations here occur on CDY A and B, uh, 570. This one occurs on 576. This one here occurs on 607, which is not a fast mutating marker. This is a more relevant mutation than the other ones. You would expect to see mutations on fast mutating markers. You would less likely to see mutations on slow mutating markers. And this is something that we'll be looking at later on because when we look at the TIP predictor. Because if you have somebody with a genetic distance of 3 out of 37, for example, but those three steps are on slow mutating markers rather than fast mutating markers, then the ones that have the mutations on slow mutating markers might be 600, 900, 1200 years ago 
uh, to the common ancestor rather than the 300, 400, 500 years ago that you'd see with the same genetic distance, 3 out of 37, but based on fast mutating markers. So it's just something to be aware of. Um, the other thing that we need to look at is the minimum, the maximum, and the mode, and we focus primarily on the mode. Um, mutations are highlighted as distances from the mode. So the mode is the most frequent value and should be distinguished from the median, which is the middle value of a series sequence of numbers, and the mean, which is the average value. The mode is the most frequent value. And you'll see here that the mode for, well, the first marker is 15. In fact, they're all 15 because every single value is 15. If you come over to one of the fast mutating markers, such as CDYB, you'll see that the mode is 33, 41. But you're getting uh, 40, 42, 42, 40. Uh, so there are, are differences around that modal value. But the importance of the modal value, especially in a group of people, is that the modal haplotype is likely to be the genetic signature of the common ancestor to that group of people. So, in fact, it's frequently called the ancestral modal haplotype. It's likely to be the, mode, the haplotype of the ancestor of everybody in that group. Likely to be in 99% of cases, probably. Um, sometimes the modal haplotype is skewed. If you get a whole bunch of people from the same family testing, um, and they can skew the modal haplotype away from the ancestral uh, version and towards their own particular family version. We always compare new members who are joining our project to the member closest to the modal haplotype. We always compare new members to the, to the modal haplotype as much as possible. Um, that gives us an anchor for this particular genetic family. So one of the important, so that's just a, a kind of a, a basics of um, why you would group people together um, and how uh, and what it actually looks like on the public page of your YDNA project. But a very, very important question is why do you actually group people together? And the answer is because different pieces of evidence point to the probability that they are all closely related. So, what are those different pieces of evidence? Some of them are going to be traditional genealogical markers, some of them are going to be genetic markers. And if you, you need to combine those two when you are grouping people into a group. So, I've come up with eight criteria for grouping. Uh, this is based on my Farrell DNA project, and I've written uh, in the Farrell DNA project blog that the allocation of a particular member to a specific genetic family is based on the presence of some or all of the following criteria. So it's some or all. These can be considered to be markers or indicators of a possible close connection, and the more criteria that are present, the more likely that there is a real relationship between those members in that family within a genealogical time frame by which I mean since the common usage of surnames, not the introduction, the common usage of surnames, which is about the last 700 years or so in many cultures, not all cultures, but in many of them. And these criteria consist of both traditional genealogical indicators as well as genetic ones. So for example, in my Farrell project, the, if you're comparing two members or a new member joins the group, the new member has the same surname as the other people in that group. So that will be Farrell, or one of its many putative variants, such as Farrell, Farrelly, O'Farrell, O'Farrell, Frawley, Farley. You know, then you get out to the, the, the kind of rarer variants, but it, the, the person, that's the first marker that this person might be related to the group. It's just like you're at a party and, and you meet somebody called Parkhurst. And they say, oh, well, my name's Parkhurst, your name's Parkhurst, maybe we're related. The surname is a genealog genealogical marker of possible relatedness. The second marker is the genetic distance between two members. And um, at a Y-DNA 37 level, you're looking at a genetic distance up to about four. That's what Family Tree DNA have um, suggested. You will see it at five, and you will see close connections at six. But a genetic distance at four with somebody with whom you share the same surname 
is likely to indicate that you have a common ancestor sometime within the last 300 to 600 years. The TIP24 score is greater than 80% when compared against the group modal haplotype. Um, now, who has used the TIP calculator? Several people, but not many. How many people don't know what the TIP calculator actually is? The vast majority of the audience. Well, it gives me great pleasure to inform you that the TIP calculator is called so because it's the time predictor. And it is a measure of um, over what period of time are we like, you know, within what, how many generations, say 24 generations, what is the likelihood that two people are connected within a certain time period? We'll look at that a little bit more closely. But for now, all you need to know is that uh, if you use this tool, it will give you a, uh, a percentage, a probability of relatedness at four generations, 8, 12, 16, 24. We're only going to use the 24 generation time point, and we're not interested in the time at all. We're just interested in the actual percentage at a certain cutoff as a measure of relatedness. And we'll take a little bit closer look at that as well. Um, the fourth criterion is the presence of rare marker values among group members, and we'll be looking at that. Uh, the results of SNP testing if performed, are consistent among the members of the particular group. For example, there's no evidence that some are on separate branches of the Y tree. You're not going to have a, a close relationship with somebody if one is on one branch that split off 10,000 years ago and one is on another branch that split off 15,000 years ago. So we look at SNP testing as well and make sure that the SNP tests, where available, are consistent. And then the last three are purely genealogical markers. The same surname variant is present or predominant in the particular group to which that person belongs. The same most distant known ancestor location is <coughs> present in that particular group. For example, in my Spiran project, they all come from Limerick. You know, you, you group them together based on genetics, and then you look and you see, oh, Limerick, 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 Limerick. This is another marker ver uh, validating the grouping of those people together. And in some cases, you actually get the same ancestor. You know, that, that is the marker that really tells you that these people are all related. If in each of their individual independent genealogies, they all go back to Luke Spiran, born in Limerick in 1794. Okay, but they never realized that they were cousins to each other. So those are the eight criteria. Let's take a quick look at the Farrell Project. You cannot read the, de the detail, and there's no need to, but what you'll see here is that all of these are a separate genetic family. The same surname variant is in GF1 and GF2. GF1 is Farley, 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 Farley. There's an Ambrose in there because he's probably an NPE. In GF2, we have Farrell, 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 Farrell. Um, and in GF3, we have the same MDKA and the same location. And I can read it here with my glasses on. Um, but just to let you know, GF3 is down here. And the MDKA is Gabriel Ferrell, born in 1743 in Virginia. And we've got several, uh, several people with slightly different dates of birth. But it actually looks to be exactly the same person in these three trees. So these are wonderful, independent um, uh, ways of verifying that you have grouped the people into the right families. Now, the genetic distance criteria for a match vary depends, depending on whether you're, you've tested 12, 25, 37, 67, or 111, and Family Tree DNA on their um, uh, Frequently Asked Questions website have uh, these very tightly related, tightly related, related, probably, only possibly, probably not, not related. Um, but if you look at here, this is the, the most important one. Um, in order to qualify as probably related, you need to have a genetic distance that is no greater than 10% of the value of the markers. So 10% of 12 is, is 1, they don't have it there. 10% of 25 is roughly 2. 10% of 37 is roughly 4. 10% of 67 is roughly 7. And 10% of 111 they have six to seven here, but it could be more than that. I would put it more around about 10. So it's roughly about 
uh, that, that's how you would calculate it. Um, and what I would suggest is that you use genetic distance as your first guide to tell you whether or not two people are likely to be related and belonging to the same genetic family. Um, and then secondly, for those members who are only probably or only possibly related, so say like a genetic distance of 4 at 37, um, you turn to the tip tool to give you a little bit more granular feel of whether or not they're likely to be related. Sure. When you're doing that grouping, do you uh, make a distinction then between the fast mutating DYSs and the others? Or no. You just take them all at face value. At face, genetic distance doesn't take into account fast mutating markers oh, or slow muta mutating markers, and that's a very, very good point because, um, like I said previously, uh, three, a distance of three on slow mutating markers is going to be much more significant than a distance of three on, on well, when 37. You do your I would initially I would just look at uh, say at 37 anyone who is a distance of one a genetic distance of one or two I'd plonk them in the same group immediately if it's three or four I tend to be a little bit more conservative because the risk of convergence and we'll, we'll talk about that is we haven't quantified it and I suspect and I'm beginning we're beginning to see examples of where convergence is uh, more of a problem than we realize because it's hidden. It is a hidden problem and we cannot see it. But uh, for, for those at a distance of three or four, I would turn to the TIP calculator and do a, a TIP assessment. Um, and I would actually separate out groups. I'd have those who are one and two and are closely related, I'd put them into, say, genetic family, sorry, genetic family 2A, and those who were just that little bit further out and could be, could be convergence, especially if the surname variant is like Farrell and Frawley. Are they really variants of each other, or am I thinking this is a variant, but it's not? I'm going to actually have a, a, a 2B version of this particular genetic family, which actually includes most of the outliers, rather than what I call the core group that I can be confident about that they're all related to each other. So that's just my own particular approach. In your family grouping, if you have some of your members at, say, 37 and some at 111, do you use your 10% rule to try to bring them together? I would use my 10% rule, yes. If somebody has 111, I would still go by the 10% rule. Um, but with 111, I might say, okay, if you've got 0, 1, 2, uh, and even 3 to 5, up to 5, they would go into the core group. Uh, 6, 7, up to 10, I would want to do the tip calculator just to see that I'm not putting a convergent sample into the core group. And I might, keep them, I might be inclined to put them into the peripheral group, the 2B group, uh, initially, unless there was convincing evidence that would m move them up into the core group. Um, so let's look at the uh, TIP calculator. When you're going into the admin pages, this is the genetic distance tab that will actually give you access to each individual person in the project and it will tell you their particular genetic distance to everybody else. And if you want a full explanation of that, look at the YouTube video about setting up your DNA project because it will actually take you through, you click here, then you click here, then you click here, uh, so it actually takes you through step by step. What I'm giving you today is more of a kind of theoretical overview. I'm trying to cover a lot in a relatively short space of time given my uh, predisposition to talking a lot. Um, the second one just below that is access to the tip calculator. And let's have a look at that. So here is the Spiran surname project. I've put in a certain Mr. Spiran and I'm comparing uh, Y-DNA 37 markers uh, which show five mismatches. The probability that Mr. 238328, uh, it turns out to be Mr. Wall because we thought he might be an NPE, um, and Mr. Spiran, H1223, share a common ancestor within the last four generations is 0 0.8, 11, 34 at 12, 59 at 16, 78 at 20, and 90 at 24. Now, um, 
The timed most recent common ancestor estimations are broad brushstrokes. They are very, very crude. And the problem with STOR markers specifically is that they do mutate a lot more frequently than the SNP markers. And when they mutate, they can go backwards, they can go forwards, say, a thousand years ago, and they change from a value of 16 to a value of 17, and then 800 years later, they change back to the original. They go back to 16. What's the problem? Somebody has a value of 16, you've got a value of 16, hey, we must be closely related. Uh, uh, your ancestor was a thousand years ago, not 200 years ago. So the backward mutations with STOR uh, markers can really throw a spanner in the works and can make people look more closely related to you than they actually are. So that's why um, uh, there's a problem with STOR uh, ass assessment and evaluation. And uh, that's why the time to most recent common ancestor is frequently misleading. Because if you have these back mutations, it can make that most recent common ancestor look closer than he actually is. Uh, I always <clears throat> talk about a statistician meeting a genealogist at a cocktail party, and the statistician saying to the genealogist, you'll be delighted to hear, I have finally started doing my family tree. And the genealogist goes, oh, that's brilliant. Um, who are you starting with? And he said, oh, my grandfather, he was a fantastic person. Oh, really? And when was he born? And then the statistician says, well, I am 99% confident that there is a 95% probability that he was born sometime within the last 24 generations. <laughs> <laughs> At which case the genealogist says, I have a roast in the oven and exits stage left, pursued by a bear. Um, so uh, that is TMRC8. It's like, it's, it is accurate, but it's one, the statistician's perspective of things is very different to the genealogist's perspective of things and a lot of the time, they don't necessarily talk in ways that are helpful to each other. So uh, that's the first point. They're wildly broad and of, I would say, minimal genealogical value. Um, we are interested more in the TIP24 score because it gives you this percentage and because the TIP calculator takes into account something that genetic distance does not. Genetic distance does not take into account whether it's a slow or a fast mutating marker, but the TIP calculator does. So in that way, you're going to get a much more accurate assessment of relatedness by turning to the TIP calculator. And a lot of this is based on the work of James Irvine and the Irvine uh, DNA project. Um, so we're looking just at the 24 generations. That's why we call it the TIP24 score. And it's only of interest for determining the, determining the closeness of the relationship between the various project members. So if somebody has a genetic distance of, say, 4 out of 37, I would go to the TIP calculator and I would set my threshold for inclusion into the same genetic family based on the mood that I was in uh, that day. <laughs> um, it could be 60%. It could be 90%. I think you have to <clears throat> choose your own uh, threshold. With the Farrell project, I've gone for, for 90%, and I've been quite conservative. Uh, with James's Irvine project, he started at 80%, he went to 60%, I'm not sure what he is now, but um, maybe there's less questions about what is a variant of Irvine compared to what is a variant of Farrell. So it's Frawley and uh, Farley, are they variants? Farris, is that a variant of Farrell? Far, far or Farrow. Um, you know, so there are men, in that situation, I would be much more conservative and I would choose a cutoff of 90. But if you choose between 60 and 90, that will probably work quite well. So, what do you do with a borderline tip score? You've got a genetic distance of 4 at 37. Um, it may, uh, that's when I would actually upgrade to 67, you know, and that, that answers your question, I think, that this is one of the situations where you would consider upgrading. You, you've got, you've done your genetic distance, 4 out of 37, you've done your tip calculator, it's 89%. It's just outside my threshold. That's when I might consider upgrading to 67 and then repeating the tip score using the 67 marker level rather than the 37 one. And that might get, give me a better idea of whether they're closely related or not. And it is quite interesting when you do that because you actually see people um, 
at, at each level, they're in, they're out. Oh, they're back in again. Oh, no, they're back out again. You know, going from 25 to 37 to 67 to 111. So, you know, and 111, you know, even at 67, you might have to upgrade further to 111 and then repeat the tip calculator uh, to get a more refined analysis. So that's uh, the tip calculator. But another marker is rare marker values. And this can be very, very useful indeed. Um, it can be even specific for certain genetic families in your project. So for example, here we have the short tandem repeat. Um, and it is a short sequence of bases repeated many times. G, A, 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 G, A, 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 G, A, A, A. Um, here is the STR. Here is the ST, some examples of STR markers. This is 449, 448, 456. You can see that the repeat motif is tetra, meaning four. So there are four bases that are repeated. Um, in the first one, it's TTTC, repeated n times, um, and the average is 30. If we actually look at this 458, it's GAAA, repeated n number of times. The average is 17. But that, of course, is the average. What is the distribution of that in the population? And this is taken from the Sorensen uh, database, which um, I'm not sure if you can access this anymore, uh, because unfortunately, because of legal reasons, it was taken down, um, which is a great, great loss. But uh, it has been hopefully replaced with, or it will be replaced with other sources. The YHRD a website does have some information, but not a huge amount. The Sorensen was really, really good for this. Uh, but you'll see here that uh, a repeat of 17 occurs in 32% of the population, 18 occurs in 15, 16 in 24. At the extremes, a repeat value of 10 is only present in 0.003%. And a, tw a repeat value of 23 is 0.003%. So this is, these are what rare market values are. Now, this, of course, is in the general population. So this is all the haplogroups. If you look at all the haplogroups, these are the repeat values you'll get. But we're more interested in the distribution for the particular haplogroup that we are, are dealing with in our particular project. So, for example, in my Spirin project, all I2B1, I'm really only interested in the, percentage, the percentages and distribution for that I2B1 haplogroup. In the Farrell project, they're all OR1B, and so I'll only be interested in the distribution within the OR1B haplogroup. Now, luckily for us, Leo Little has actually done the some of the six major haplogroups. He's done, and I'm going to read this out, he's done haplogroup E3A at the, at the top in red, E3B in pink, he's done G, I, J2, OR1A, and OR1B. And that is what you see here in this uh, uh, column at the very start. And this is marker number one. The locus is 9393. This is marker 393. And this is the number of people he's tested in each of these haplogroups. 500, 1,000, 450, so-and-so. Uh, 22,000 for haplogroup or one b And this is the distribution of marker values in that particular, for that particular marker. 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. So here you go in Norwin B, 91% of people have a value of 13 for the first marker, uh, DYS393. This is very, very useful information. And he's done this for all 111 markers. So this is a very, very good way of looking at rare marker values. So for example, uh, a repeat value of 15, he has 0 0.00 for haplogroup or one b but it actually occurs in 15% uh, of people with in haplogroup E3BA, okay? So that's why it's important to look at the haplogroup distributions rather than the general population distributions of these rare marker values. Um, oh yeah, he's only gone up to 67 STR markers, not 111. And he's only done six of the haplogroups, uh, whereas it'd be nice to have all of the haplogroups included. But most of us, uh, being of Western European origin, on our direct mail lines, it's quite handy to have OR1B and OR1A in there. Now, when I apply this to the Farrell DNA project, uh, 
I found that in uh, genetic family 3, which is this one here, uh, there was an unusual value for, for marker 449. Marker 449 is here, and these are the values in genetic family 3. They are all 26. Um, this only occurs in 1.7% of the general population using the Sorensen database. It occurs in 0% of the Orwin B population. So it's 0.0001%, something like that. This is very, very rare. And I only discovered this after I had grouped everybody together. Another useful validation that the grouping of these people is valid. Okay? So rare marker values can be very, very useful. Do go back to Leo Little's um, uh, spreadsheet. You can get it there on Roots Web. And uh, hopefully, in due course, we'll get values for all of the haplogroups, but nobody as yet has repeated Leo's uh, work. And um, that was a wonderful legacy that he's left us. He passed away in 2005, I believe, but uh, his legacy lives on. Now, the other, uh, yes, here's a useful example from the Wheaton DNA project. And um, this is run by Kelly Wheaton. In her Wheaton group uh, B, I believe it is, she has uh, these people here, and you can see they're all, uh, there's no colors there apart from these ones here, indicating that there's no mutations, they're all exact matches. But have a look at Kelly's first five markers within her project. And this is another example where the 12 marker test might be all you need to actually group people together. Uh, in group B, which is uh, this group up here, and then the second genetic family is group C down here, the marker value for um, uh, 393 is 14, which occurs in only 5% of um, the Or1B population. Um, the marker for uh, the second marker, 390, uh, there's, uh, is 24, which occurs in 60%, so that's not rare. Uh, the third marker, the value is 16, which occurs in 1%, uh, so that is very rare. And in the last marker, the marker value only occurs in 8% of people. So she actually has three rare marker values in the first five markers of the Y-DNA panel, as a result of which the incidence of these three rare marker values occurring together is around about, the chances are one in 62,000. So the chances of this happening by chance are one in 62,000, and that's irrespective of the surname. So Kelly knows that if she gets somebody with the Wheaton or Wheaton surname and these three marker values within their first five markers, she can place them immediately in group B. So rare marker values can be very, very useful. And um, uh, it, it can be a situation where you say to somebody, don't bother testing Y-DNA 37, test Y-DNA 12. And if you don't fit into group B, then we'll upgrade you to 37 and that way we'll save money. You know, and that, that's a good way of actually spending the money in the public fund for your project very, very wisely. So uh, a Y-DNA 12 marker test is sufficient in this case to allocate some members to group B. SNP testing. The terminal SNP must be consistent within a given group. There is a single nucleotide, nucleotide polymorphism. It's normally C, C and it's normally uh, uh, G, G, A, T. And here it's GAAT. So that's a, a single nucleotide polymorphism. The great advantage of SNPs over STORs is we have 111 STORs. We have 50,000 SNPs, advantage number one. Advantage number two, SNPs tend to mutate once and don't mutate back. So they tend to be much more uh, permanent than STOR mutations. You don't get the problematic occurrence of back mutations with SNP markers. Um, so those are two important differences between SNPs and STORs. And we started off with very few SNP markers, maybe a couple of hundred, um, but over time, and I showed you this this morning, as we've uh, found out more and more SNP markers, and now we have 50,000 on the Y-DNA, we're having much more uh, branches on the world family tree. Um, there's a variety of different companies that will do SNP testing. Family Tree DNA does it, and they do the lab testing for the National Genographic Project. Uh, Geno2 was the most latest one from, from, from National Geno. Uh, I think Geno3 is coming out in the not-too-distant future. 
Um, you have Chromo2 from Britain's DNA. You also have the big Y testing from uh, Family Tree DNA. You have the full genomes uh, test as well. And you can also get individual SNPs from uh, the YSeq company. Uh, so there's a lot of activity with SNP markers at the moment, and they are going to assume much more importance in due course. Big problem is they are expensive. You know, you'd get the, um, the, uh, the, uh, the full genome corporation's test was $1,200 a few years ago. Um, the big Y is now $425 US in the sale. Um, but uh, Family Tree DNA are uh, introducing these deep clayed <coughs> panels for select haplogroups, uh, which is a cheaper version of the big Y and a more focused version of the big Y. How many people have done a deep clayed panel? Okay, David and Paul, how many people have done a big Y? Okay, um, I've done a big Y. Um, several people in the Mike Gleason group have done a big Y. Uh, it will eventually help identify individual branches of the family. I'm going to talk to you about that in a while. Um, SNP no, testing. No. Sorry? It's a donation. A donation? Donation. Scientific donation. Oh, it is? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and what I'm hoping with the deep clade panel, because I have asked about this, is it next generation sequencing? No, it's not. Um, is it a chip-based marker? No, it's not. So they're doing something in between. Does anybody know? I mean, Mike, do you know what the... Um, deep plate panel is? Or David, sorry, David, do you know what the deep plate panel well, I is? It was chip -based. I thought it was chip-based as well, but I asked uh, Family Tree DNA and they said, no, it's not actually chip-based. It's um, something between chip-based and next generation sequencing. Because I was thinking the trouble with the deep plate panel is that um, it's not going to identify new SNPs when you do it. Whereas Big Y being next generation sequencing, it will identify new SNPs as well as all the old SNPs that we know already. Um, but the deep plate panels are going to be somewhere in the two. I would have thought it would have been chip-based, <coughs> which means it's just fixed. We're just testing for these and we're not going to find anything else. But in fact, I've been told, and I don't understand the technology behind it, that it possibly will discover new SNPs as well. So watch this space. This is going to be the next big thing. The other great thing about it is it will be more affordable than the big Y, which is 425 in the sale, or than the full genome corporation's test as well. So uh, SNP testing establishes the terminal SNP, and it's probably wise to choose the member closest to the modal haplotype if you're going to, to um, use somebody to do uh, SNP testing for the, for the group. Um, it assists with difficulties in grouping people to a specific genetic family. It helps reduce the possibility of convergence, and we'll look a little bit about that in a while. Um, it gives information on deep ancestry and possible geographical origins. Uh, it helps identify branches within a genetic family, and we'll take a little look at that as well. Um, and then how to SNP test. Do you do the big Y? Do you do wait for the deep clade panel? Um, how many people within a given genetic family do you actually test? Those are still questions that um, remain to be answered. But the best uh, guidance that you can get is from the administrators of the haplogroup projects that you should join that are relevant for your particular genetic families within your DNA project. So all of your members should also be signed up to the haplogroup projects. The administrators are a great source of advice and support. They will tell you what direction you should go in. They'll all say, do the big Y if you can afford to spend the money, but if you can't, they may advise you on targeted SNP testing. And that's what we've been doing in the Spear and Surname project up till now. Um, here's an example of convergence. This is, first of all, divergence, and it's a, a particular marker. Uh, it started off 10,000 years ago with a value of eight. And over the course of the millennia, uh, this particular group here, they um, had various um, mutations, and so in the, in the present day, uh, they have a value of 13 for that particular marker. But if we compare it with the blue line, they didn't really change much at all over the course of time. There was one mutation back 7,000 years ago, and then they just stayed there, and the, they still have that, that, that mutation from 7,000 years ago. There's actually a lack of divergence with that particular group. 
they haven't changed that much at all. This green one has changed quite a lot. It's gone in the opposite direction, and um, then, it, but it's also gone back again on itself. So there's a lot of backward mutations here. And if you look up here, it's actually now coinciding with the marker for the blue line. Um, so if, if a green person and a blue person tested, they'd have the same value for that marker, and that might make them think, hey, we're closely related. Uh, uh, your ancestor was 10,000 years ago, not 1,000 years ago. So that's an example of convergence with one marker. Of course, with, with uh, 37 markers, 67, 111 markers, the chances of this happening with all the markers that they initially diverge and then converge on each other is a lot more rare but it does happen. Um, it happens less at 111. 10 minutes left. <laughs> less at 111. Um, a little bit more at 67, a little bit more at 37. Um, but it does actually happen. And I am going to show you an example from Alexander Stewart, fourth high steward of Scotland, uh, born in 1214. And there were two lines. The lines descended from James Stewart uh, and the line descended from the Bunkle Stewarts. Now, James Stewart's line has this snip marker absent, S781. Uh, this line has S781 present, and that helps distinguish people belonging to both lines. So, plus or minus 781. Um, but let's have a look. Actually, we have Earl Castle Stewart and Paul Thompson, and we have Living Stewart descendants down here. So Earl Castle Stewart and Paul Thompson belong to the group that don't have the SNP marker present. And there's Earl Castle Stewart there. He's negative for that SNP. There's Paul Thompson, negative for that SNP. But Fred Stewart from the Bunkle line is positive from, for that uh, SNP. But let's look at their genetic distance. Earl Castle Stewart and Paul Thompson, who are on the, Stewart, the, other, the left side of the tree, they have a genetic distance of uh, th uh, three and a genetic distance of three to Fred Stewart, who is on the other branch of the family. Um, and Fred Stewart himself has a genetic distance of four to Earl and three to Paul, and that is at 67 markers. There is a genetic distance of three out of 67 between people who are on completely different branches of the human evolutionary tree. And that is why genetic distance can be misleading, and there may very well be people in your projects that shouldn't be in the same group, because they actually sit on different SNP branches. That's why SNP testing is going to be very, very important. So to come back then to the eight criteria for grouping, uh, the member has the same surname. Genetic distance between two members indicates a close or very close relationship. The TIP24 score is helpful. Greater than 80% would be recommended. The presence of rare marker values is important. Um, the results of SNP testing are consistent among the members of the particular group. We saw they were not consistent in the last example. The same surname variant is present or predominant in a particular group once you've grouped people together. The same location is present in a particular group once you've grouped people together. And the same ancestor might appear in the group once you have grouped people together. So those are the eight criteria for grouping. And that probably is the most important message to take away from uh, this session today, is it's giving you some guidelines on how to group people together. Um, when do you upgrade to 67 or 111? If you have no matches at 37 markers, that would be an indication perhaps to upgrade. How many people have no matches at 37 markers? Approximately 25%, <coughs> based on a sample of 65 people that I uh, uh, examined who came to the London show. So it's as close to a random sample as I can get. 25% of them had no matches at 37 markers. 50% of them had between 1 and 10 matches. And 25% of them had greater than, uh, greater than 10 matches at 37 markers. So the first indication for upgrading would be no matches at 37. That might reveal matches that have been hidden at 37 if you upgrade to 67. And at 67, you might want to upgrade to 111 if you have no matches. It may reveal hidden matches at 67 that you didn't see. So if you upgrade to 111, it may reveal these hidden matches. It's a long shot. But if someone is willing to pay the price, then go ahead and do it. Also to assist uh, 
difficulties in subgrouping. If you've got a borderline TIP score, like we discussed, that would be another indication to upgrade to 67 or 111. Another indication would be if you have lots of matches at 37 markers, say greater than 50, and it's rare, but it does happen, um, this helps reduce the possibility of convergence. If you see lots of, mark lots of matches at 37 markers, I would say the risk of convergence is very, very high. And that would be an indication to upgrade to 67 or 111 markers. It can also be helpful to identify sub-branches within a genetic family using mutation history trees or uh, phylograms or cladograms. Um, uh, for mutation history trees, you should read John Robb. He's done a very, very useful um, article on that. And we'll talk a little bit about phylograms and cladograms. Uh, it can also be useful for more precisely estimating how closely two people are related to each other. So, for example, here is the uh, relationship range. I'll, I'll show it in a table to make it more legible. But this is taken from the family tree, frequently asked questions. Um, if two men share a surname, how should the genetic distance at 111 be interpreted? If you have zero genetic distance at 111, 50% of your of people will, will you'll be related at a first cousin level. So uh, if it's one <coughs> out of 111, 50% of people will be related as second cousins, and 50% greater than second cousins, and so on. So 111 can be very, very useful for looking at how close people are related to each other. Lastly, before I finish, if I ever will, um, identifying branches within a genetic family, mutation history trees. Um, there's John Robb's uh, reference there. Uh, this will always be on the YouTube channel. You can pause it at this point in time and take them down. Um, you can use, develop these cladograms, or mutate, rather than family history trees, they're mutation history trees. And the idea is that with your family history tree there, you can work on a mutation history tree and it should be possible to overlay it on what you know of your family history, and that gives you what should be a similar pattern. Your family history will go up halfway up the cladogram, and then the cladogram will take over and will tell you where the individual branches occurred. Was it two generations back, three generations back, and then did this branch come in four generations back? That should be technically feasible with uh, uh, an analysis of a combination of SNP markers and this is Alex Williamson's tree. You can see my Gleason's over there and the unique um, the SNP markers we have for the Gleason clan um, uh, in combination with STR markers. And Nigel McCarthy from the um, uh, McCarthy and, and Munster Irish project, he's uh, one of the admins on the McCarthy project, he is using a combination of both SNP which are the dark uh, ones in bold, and STR markers, which are the ones in not in bold, uh, to actually subdivide people into different uh, branches on the tree. This is at a very rudimentary stage because we don't have enough data. We don't have enough SNP data. We don't have enough people um, updating to 111 markers. But in due course, we will be able to do this type of analysis, and if we're lucky, we'll probably be able to say with 90% probability that this person over here and this person over here, they've got a most distant known ancestor in 1800, but three generations ago is when they had the common ancestor. We should be able to get back with reasonable probability, that's the hope anyway, to be able to tell you, you may not be able to name the individuals, but you can say that this person here and this person here had a common great-grandfather. That's the aspiration. And I'm hopeful that we'll be able to do that with about 90% accuracy. So that is really everything I have to say about uh, Y-DNA uh, testing and Y-DNA projects. I hope it's given you food for thought. In the remaining 45 seconds, let's have some <laughs> questions. Thank you. We have about two minutes, so if there's any questions... Right, the lady here? Um, my husband's 
you know, um, you're taking a chance. Um, it may very well be that your husband has a genetic distance of five out of 37 with somebody with the same surname. Just by, by chance, all of his mutations have occurred, say, in the first 37 markers. And that match doesn't show up in his list of matches because it's outside of the threshold that found between the DNA set or at 37, or 37 marker level. If he upgrades it to 67, it may be that there are no mutations in 37 to 67 panel, and he will be a genetic distance of 5 out of 67. That's your match. It will actually show up as a match at that point in time in your husband's list. It is not likely, but it is possible. So the question you have to, to ask yourself really is, is it worthwhile upgrading 67 in the hope of finding a match, or is my money better spent, doing, spent uh, elsewhere doing something else? Um, is he in the relevant happy group project? No. no? Fine. I, before upgrading to 67, I would join the relevant happy group project and see if he, see what group that the administrator puts him in. It will take a couple of weeks for the admin to realize Somebody else has joined and it'll take them a while to recruit them. But then look at the matches or the, the other people within the group that your husband is in um, and see if there's any clues there. You might find some people with the same surname, but they're a genetic distance of five or six out of 37, and that's why they don't appear in your husband's matches. So I'd say, first of all, join the Happy Group project and um, also talk to the admin and ask them exactly the same question. What advice would you give? I think that's time, yeah, that's unfortunately, fine. but uh, I'm around for the rest of the day. Please ask me any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Maurice Gleason. My Morris. pleasure. My pleasure, um, Kathy McNamara. <laughs> <laughs> we appreciate you sharing your vast knowledge with us, and I'm sure we'll be approaching you sometime today. Great. Okay, thank Excellent. You. Thank you. There's a 15-minute break, or a little less, uh, and our next session starts at 2.30. Yes. Uh -huh. Let's pull that one out.